Can you hear me? Yes. Is there, is there any sound? Um, I had this idea that before I started uh, the performance that I would uh, go to the cafe here and, and uh, have a cup of coffee to, uh, to be more awake. Um, so I, I went out a little bit before Mr. Gillick had finished because I was afraid that there would be like a big queue in the break. <laughs> and then, that I would be like really nervous in the queue of maybe not getting my coffee and then getting too nervous to be able to, to do anything um, here afterwards. So I went outside like after Mr. Gillick had been speaking for uh, 52 minutes or so. I thought he'd probably be finished soon. And uh, I went outside to go to the cafe and it was very nice out there by the cafe. It was very still. There was the Vilnius skyline, a part of the Vilnius skyline. Um, there seemed to be an advertisement for Canon, big red, but after having looked at it a little bit more, it was actually an advertisement for Can Can, <laughs> which uh, is a pizza company. Uh, and then probably a pizza company with a French touch. Maybe you can get pizza with oysters from Can Can Pizza. Um, or, um, or maybe champagne pizza. Um, and uh, this thought appeared to me now, uh, as I'm speaking, that have you heard about Toblerone? Uh, the Swiss milk chocolate. Uh, it, if you look at it from the side, it's, it's like a triangle. And people think it's designed like a mountain. <coughs> but according to what you can read, that is, you know, what you can read on Wikipedia, uh, Mr. Toblerone, uh, who wasn't called Toblerone, um, it was inspired by the Cancan show in Paris, where the Cancan dancer at the finale made a triangular shape. <laughs> this is how I will make my chocolate. Um, and there will be, at one point in my little talk, a reference to Toblerone, uh, and a reference to the dancing pig on the package of Toblerone, the dancing pig in front of the Matterhorn. Unfortunately, there was some kind of trouble in the production of the signs for, for this talk, so I can't show the dancing pig. Um, but it's there, and you can all check afterwards uh, if you would happen to buy Toblerone. I mean, you don't have to buy it. I'm not promoting Toblerone here. You can, you can, you can go to the store. Uh, for instance, um, if you're like me and a little bit neurotic, so you come to the airport early, then what, you know, what can you do? You can go and look at the Toblerone packages and you will see the pig there. How about that? Um, are you familiar with Oh, I thought you would stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Olson, we don't like your jokes here. <laughs> um, is it okay? Okay. But it is, if there are any questions, or if you want to stop it, uh, or if you want me to talk about something else, you know, just raise your hand. Um, and I, I, I was, uh, I was raised in in Sweden in the 70s, where. You know, there was this new, new pedagog ped ped pedagogics, uh, um, uh, new didactics. You know, didactics. <laughs> 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 
So I should get to the point. <laughs> now just raise your hand if there's anything that I'm un unclear. If there's anything unclear, if you want to take another direction, just raise your hand. Uh, and if I don't see your hand, because I'm, you know, raise your voice and your hand. Thank you. Um, do you know the, the island of Gotland? It's like the part of Sweden which is closest to here, in the Baltic Sea. Um, and uh, I found there this summer at a barn sale uh, this thing. So I had to run all the way to the, over to the hotel uh, and buy like very, very expensive coffee. Uh, and was then afraid that maybe Mr. Gillick had, had ended his thing then, right when I'd gone outside. Uh, and then, you know, everyone, where is he, da da da, and people would be sent home and there would be nothing here. Uh, but it seems that we've managed things all right, and I should just get to the point. Uh, I found this thing at a barn sale this summer in, in, in Gotland, the Swedish island close to here. Uh, and I should have ironed it before I got here. I ironed my shirt, but I forgot to iron this. Uh, it shows uh, a young woman with a coffee pot. Uh, and there is uh, a text in Swedish. And the text says, uh, the, the drop of coffee, the drop of coffee is... Is the best of all earthly beverages. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't say drop in Swedish. Uh, you can say drop in Swedish, that's called droppe. Uh, but it's, it says tear, tell. So it's a little bit poetic. The tear of coffee. You can't say a tear of coffee in English, but you can in Swedish when you're poetic. Uh, so. So on the one hand, this is a piece of folkloristic art. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, if the funny thing is that Mr. Gillick talked about exactly the same thing that I will talk about, you know, a lot of it, um, but of course in a different way. Um, and so we're talking, we're talking about late capitalism, what is going on, how we are being manipulated, and so on and so forth. But this also shows that there seems to be almost like a genetic need of advertisement. Like, if there is no advertisement, we'll make it ourselves. <laughs> Can you also hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay. Now, <laughs> think of the Garden of Eden. I'm sorry. Dawn in in the Garden of Eden. Is that in the morning or at night? Morning. morning, yeah. Morning, the light is coming up in the Garden of Eden. Faint sounds here and there. There's Adam and Eve and the snake. And if we think about what was going on there, isn't it strange that there is no religion against apples? If there was a religion against apples, and that religion was big, a company wouldn't call itself Apple unless they only wanted to sell to Satanists. <laughs> Steve Jobs, the man behind Apple, is dead. Jobs was a Buddhist. A lot of people think that if you die as a Buddhist, the worst thing that can happen is that you're reborn as a worm who's eating meat from dead animals, or maybe even meat from animals that are alive. But Buddhism actually has a hell. Actually, Buddhism has 16 different...
different hells. Eight hot ones and eight cold ones. But you don't go there to be punished. You go there to be purified. And it's for a limited amount of time. The longest time you can spend in a Buddhist hell is three quintillion years. That's a three and eighteen zeros. So that's the worst that can happen to Steve Jobs. A three and eighteen zeros. But of course, we don't know what happens after that. Maybe then, Steve Jobs is reborn as a worm. And he knows the deal. He's a worm now. So he won't be trying to get online. And there's only meat to eat. And Steve gets upset. I'm a Buddhist. I can't eat meat. Silence. Can't we make a deal? How about fish? Silence. This is the problem with Buddhism. There's no one to complain to. <laughs> There's no one to argue with. There's no God. You're alone. Now, wherever or whatever Steve Jobs might be, I have a question for him. How can a Buddhist make such a lot of consumer electronics? But that question is so obvious that I can't get myself to ask it. Some things are so shameful that you make the shame your own even when they're dead. But I have another thing I would like to ask Steve Jobs. Why do you decide when you have a company that makes computers, phones, pods and pads to call it by the name of the fruit? These machines can do many things but you can't eat them. Other computer companies are named by what they do, like IBM, International Business Machines, or by who they are, like Hewlett Packard, or by what they would like to be, like Oracle. <laughs> but Apple doesn't make apples. Apple isn't an apple, and presumably Apple doesn't want to become an apple. How about calling Apple Jobs? How about calling Apple by the name of the man behind it? Especially now, when he's dead and he can't ruin anything. But that wouldn't work, because in England, Jobs is slang for a piece of excrement. When Apple started out, the main enemy was IBM, International Business Machines. So why didn't Apple call itself Apples. When your enemy is in the plural, why not pluralize yourself? Why be one lonely apple against a big bunch of business machines? 
And still, that lonely apple became a threat to the big machines. Because Apple had a graphic user interface, which meant that normal people could actually use it. This made IBM a little bit worried. So they called Bill Gates. And Bill Gates made a graphic user interface for IBM's PCs. And he called it Windows. But calling Windows Windows was a bad idea. <laughs> Through a window, you can look into your computer. But to really get in there, don't you want a door or a gate? <laughs> Why doesn't Bill Gates call Windows Gates? <laughs> That would be a promise of full access. <laughs> but maybe Bill Gates is too shy <laughs> to call Windows Gates. Because what do we really know about Bill Gates? What do we know about how Bill Gates feels about himself and his name? Face it, most people who work ridiculously hard do it because they hate themselves. Because they were bullied in school. So they become executives, so they can bully the workers. And they work really hard, so they can bully the workers even more. Or maybe Bill Gates just doesn't like punning. But if Bill Gates doesn't like punning, uh, to use one word to mean two different things, why does he give the name Word to a computer program when Word already is the word for a word? <laughs> At least he should call it Words, unless Bill wants us to believe it's for very short texts. <laughs> but maybe it would like look funny saying Words, and it's just like one word. Doesn't Microsoft sound like something you put in a washing machine? <laughs> something you add like for, the, for the final rinse? Or maybe some cloth for cleaning? I think the idea to call Windows Gates is brilliant. But maybe Bill hasn't thought about it. <laughs> But if Bill has thought about it, and he still doesn't like it, how about calling Windows Doors? Microsoft Doors. Don't just look. Break on through to the other side. You're too young for that joke. Over at Apple in Cupertino, California, Steve Jobs said, we've got an insanely great graphic user interface on a pretty good computer. Now we need to learn how to sell to the masses. Jobs wanted an expert on branding, so he hired the head of Pepsi. The name of the head was John Scully. As the new Apple head, Scully said, I shall raise the price of the Mac by 25%. So for every Mac we make, we get $500 more to use on advertising. $500. And he did. Jobs thought that each apple should be revolutionary. Scully thought Jobs was making unnecessary fuss. So after two years, Scully got the fuss maker fired. But people thought Apple computers were too expensive. So they bought PCs instead. 
And after 12 years without Steve Jobs, Apple was almost in ruins. Scully had been, had been fired, but that hadn't helped. And then the thought appeared at Apple, maybe we should bring back Jobs. And they did. And Jobs said, I'm back. Now Steve Jobs is gone from that big corporation we call life. But Jobs made Apple the third biggest company in the world. Microsoft is number 11. IBM is number 14. Coca-Cola, who sell 1.7 billion drinks per day, is number 27. Uh, it should be said that it's not only Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola owns about uh, four or 500 different brands of drinks. Um, and it's like all of them included. I've written to Coca-Cola to ask how many drinks of Coca-Cola is it, but I haven't gotten a clear answer, clear answer yet. Who's number one? Uh, ExxonMobil, an oil company. Number two is PetroChina, an oil company. And considering everyone in this world is using oil, even if it's just a plastic spoon or riding a bus, while the only people buying Apple are latter liberal hipsters. That's rather impressive. So how can Apple make su such a lot of money? Where do they get it from? It's a mystery. But the answer is, that they're getting it from us. <laughs> this was the first Apple logo. Uh, it's probably a little bit unclear in the back, but it features Isaac Newton, uh, in the process of getting hit by an apple falling from a tree, it was used for a very short time. This is the second apple logo. But it wasn't until apple got rid of that gay flag <laughs> that Apple got really big. But still, there is some doubt about the bite. Where does it come from? Doesn't that bite look like the bite of Alan Tarry? Alan Turing was a genius, and he was the leading computer expert of his time. It was through the work of Alan Turing that the British managed to crack the German Enigma code during the Second World War. Some people say that this shortened the Second World War by two years. Churchill said that's how they won it. But this didn't stop the British from prosecuting Alan Turing for being gay. With a law from 1885. So Alan Turing killed himself by eating an apple poisoned with cyanide. Today, the biggest award for computing is called the Turing Award. It's like the Nobel Prize for computing. But Apple says that nothing about their logo or name has anything to do with Alan Turing.
So, who could it be then who bit into the apple? I can see you have a suggestion. I thought snake or Adam and Eve, <laughs> all three of them. <laughs> Yes, that's the conclusion. We're back. Um, I thought for a while about Snow White, but that would give Apple trouble with the Disney people. And if Apple changed its name to Adam and Eve, it would be a funky reference to original sin and the lust for information technology. And it would also show Apple's commitment to traditional family values. <laughs> and if Apple reversed the name to Eve and Adam, it would even give its new name a progressive touch and show that Apple is truly thinking different. <laughs> When you unpack an Apple product, it doesn't say made in the USA, because it's not made in the USA, it's made in China. But there's no reason to be moralistic about apples being made in China, because an exploited worker is always an exploited worker. And it doesn't matter if it's a Chinese communist or an American redneck. When you unpack an Apple product, it says, designed in California. <laughs> but they don't grow any apples in California. It's too warm. Apples are grown in New Hampshire. In California, they grow oranges. So why not call apple orange? Isn't that the obvious idea? But maybe it's too obvious. Maybe it's the mystery of how the name Apple seems to make no sense at all that makes it so attractive. I wonder why no cola has managed to do to Coca-Cola what Apple did to IBM. Making a cola can't be that difficult. <coughs> you find the recipe on the internet, but mix the stuff together, and then you sell it. Making a computer is much more difficult. And quite frankly, who wants to buy a homemade computer? <laughs> hired Michael Jackson and Madonna to be the choice of a new generation. But Michael got strange. And Madonna got together with Warren Beatty, which made her the choice of the old generation. But maybe Pepsi sounds too much like a toothpaste. The trick about Coca-Cola is that it doesn't make you think of anything else. It doesn't make you think of brushing your teeth. It doesn't make you think of the war. It just is what it is. But what Coca-Cola is, is something made of coca leaves and cola nuts. That's where the name comes from. Coca comes from South America. It's what you make cocaine of. Cola nuts come from West Africa, where people eat it to get high, to get closer to Allah. Now, the high of the cola nut comes from caffeine, so that's rather innocent. But the coca, that's another thing. And the United States has not only a war on terror, but also 
a war on drugs. So while the United States government is sending planes to South America to spray and kill coca, Coca-Cola is buying it. But what happens to the coca that gets sprayed and poisoned but doesn't die? Do we end up drinking it? Is this why there's no organic coke? Coca-Cola say there hasn't been any cocaine in Coca-Cola since 1904. <laughs> so what they do is that they buy coca to put in the coke, but first they take the cocaine out. <laughs> but what happens to the cocaine? <laughs> Do they flush it down the toilet? Do they send it back? <laughs> In England, if you eat enough apples, you get a job. <laughs> and if you eat more, you can get more jobs. Because in England, the word job is slang for excrement. And actually, it's quite uh, a suitable word, because to sit on a toilet seat and produce this thing does produce some effort. If it comes all by itself, something is terribly wrong. <laughs> In French, it could be called an oeuvre de merde. Excuse my French. Um, a work of shit. And it would be a very suitable expression in French because the French have these toilets with a platform inside. So the French can inspect what they've done before they flush it out. And they do. <laughs> and why shouldn't they? Face it, it's a part of us. It's real. And the French, by inspecting their jobs, they get to know themselves better. Or is it the other way around, that we get rid of our jobs because we don't really feel like a part of them? And the French inspect their kaka in order to know themselves by knowing what they're not. Is this the famous difference? Or maybe is the truth somewhere in between, both at the same time? Isn't the truest thing we can say about ourselves that we're shit, but not completely? <laughs> so this is what I say when I go to an interview for a job, and they tell me to tell a little bit about myself. Well, Mr. Wilson, I'm more or less like you. I'm shit, but not completely. Here, it's interesting to look at Jean-Paul Sartre. Who thoroughly analyzed the human condition in his book, Le Etre et le Nion, sorry. Being in Nothingness, Being in Nothingness, from 1943. Sartre's conclusion was that we can't be completely happy. If we think we are, it's false consciousness. Because the existential void, the existential emptiness, is always lurking around the corner. At the same time, Coca-Cola promised Coke to every soldier, every American soldier, wherever he happened to be.
people in the back, I can say that this sign shows an American soldier in uniform, in a landscape, probably European. Um, and there's an advertisement for Coca-Cola. No matter where you go, somewhere near you, is a big friendly red sign with a trademark, Coca-Cola. It reminds you that ice cold Coca-Cola is everything refreshment should be. A clean, exciting taste. Quality you can trust. Refreshment you feel. When you drink ice cold Coca-Cola, you know it's the real thing. So that was Coca-Cola's answer to being a nothingness. It's the real thing. When IBM launched the PC in 1981, the advertisements, the, the ad agency, the advertising agency, the advertising agency wanted to make it friendly. So they wanted to use Charlie Chaplin. But there was a problem. Charlie Chaplin was left wing. And there was another problem. Charlie Chaplin was dead. Charlie Chaplin had been dead for four years. But that problem could be solved. IBM bought the rights to use Chaplin from his family and hired an actor. <laughs> and since Chaplin was dead, his being left wing wasn't that bad. So this is something to think of if you have many problems. Like sometimes they can equal each other out. The slogan for the IBM Chaplin ads was the IBM personal computer. A tool for modern times. The IBM personal computer, a tool for modern times. Referring to Chaplin's famous film from 1936. But how can modern times from 1936 be modern times in 1981? Isn't that like selling freshly squeezed orange juice from a can? And how can the title of a film about the alienation of labor in mechanized society end up as a slogan for business machines. This is worth thinking of if you plan to be famous. Do you really want to make advertisements when you're dead? It's like a modern kind of hell. It's not hot. It's not cold. It's advertising. <laughs> In Scandinavia, there are two big companies selling sanitary porcelain. They're both Swedish. One is localized outside Stockholm. It's called Gustavsberg. It's the only sanitary porcelain company in the world that also makes porcelain for eating. The other is situated in the southern Swedish town of Brumölla, where they have their head office by the central square. In Brumölla, 
sanitary porcelain is bigger than politics because the IFA office is bigger than the town hall. The biggest company for sanitary porcelain in America is called American Standard. <laughs> it's a somewhat enigmatic name. Does it mean American Standard? An American Standard to American customers used to American luxury and comfort? Like in contrast to say Bangladesh? Or does it mean American Standard in contrast to American luxury and comfort? This is confusing. Why doesn't American Standard change its name to American Luxury and Comfort? That would take away the confusion. And it would give it some class. But American Standard is more than a hundred years old. And what would happen if the customers of American Standard suddenly saw the name American Luxury and Comfort, wouldn't they think it was a new and cheap imitation? And it could also frighten those customers away who were attracted to American Standard because it seemed to promise sanitary porcelain at an affordable price. So, American Standard has wisely chosen not to change its name. But when American Standard started its sister sanitary porcelain company in Europe, they were wise enough not to call it European Standard. Because what would a European sanitary porcelain standard be? Albanian, Bulgarian or Cypriotic, Swiss or Slovenian? A film can be European, at least from an American point of view, if it's complicated, confused, <laughs> experimental, and real. But that doesn't work for sanitary porcelain. But American Standard has found a fabulous solution for its European sister company. It calls it ideal standard. <laughs> The ideal standard for everyone, always. It's pure genius because it expands and contracts all possible interpretation at one and the same time. It's the best name a company ever had. It's just a pity they're in the wrong line of business. <laughs> because it's impossible to get ridiculously rich selling sanitary porcelain. You can't really sell more than one toilet per person. <laughs> and porcelain is a very long-lasting material. <laughs> Sanitary porcelain can last a lifetime. <laughs> it can even be passed on to new generations <laughs> and still be fully functional. In the 70s, sanitary porcelain introduced color. In the 70s, you could get sanitary porcelain in avocado. And in the 80s, you could get peach. So there was a touch of sophistication with avocado in the 70s. And a touch of decadence with peach in the 80s. But in the 90s, sanitary porcelain in color was just something you laughed at. Sophisticated hotel had to change their sophisticated sanitary porcelain to stay sophisticated. In the 90s, people wanted their sanitary porcelain white so they could check that it was clean. After all the sophistication of the 70s, 
and all the decadence <laughs> of the 80s. In the 90s, people also started to worry about the environment. But sanitary porcelain managed those worries in a very impressive way. Because those worries never became worries about flushing things out into the environment. Things would be okay if we just got a toilet with a big or small flush. I have to confess, I never used a small flush. I think of using it, but in the end I don't. I'm not sure what happens. It's not that I don't want to save water for Africa. Maybe the big flush is just too attractive. Or maybe I'm afraid that the small flush won't be enough. <laughs> Honestly, is there anyone here who uses the small flush? Anyone? No one? There's one. Two. Three. Four. When there's one. When you miss the big one. Okay. Does that happen often? It'll be interesting to see what sanitary porcelain has ready for us, for us in the future. <laughs> Maybe some kind of Teflon-like antibacterial coating, or an auto-cleaning electrical current. If sanitary porcelain wants to make serious money, they have to think of something. Christians, Jews, and Muslims believe in the same God. And they all believe that God created this world. But Jews and Muslims think God got one thing wrong. The pig. And actually, food experts today say that pig meat isn't very healthy. Supposedly, you use more energy digesting it than you get out of it. So it's like putting the wrong kind of petrol in your car and it drives backwards. Or connecting your computer to the wrong socket and hours of work is suddenly gone. But if pig meat is bad, and cow meat is okay. Why don't we just eat the cows and get milk from the pigs? Switzerland could be pioneers for a milk industry based on pigs. The Swiss has a great tradition for fine engineering. It would be no problem for the Swiss to design a milking machine for pigs. And pigs are much better than cows at climbing mountains. <laughs> and Toblerone could lead the way with its dancing pig in front of the Matterhorn. Toblerone was invented in Switzerland in 1908. But now it's owned by Kraft in Northfield, Illinois. Bill Gates 
owns 0.3% of Croft. That means that Bill Gates is the owner of 100 million top runners. <laughs> Bill Gates also owns 0.4% of Coca-Cola, which means that Bill Gates is the owner of 750 million bottles, millions of bottles of Coke. Something with the bubbles. It's like when, but yeah, I've been drinking bubble water the whole day. It's been going fine. And it's like, if you suddenly, I mean, there's a risk of doing it. And it but if you suddenly switch to, to like water without bubbles, you get completely confused. Uh, that's really a bad idea. Steve Jobs. No. Bill Gates, Bill Gates, but Steve Jobs is dead. Um, Bill Gates. It, it was Bill Gates who owned the Coca-Cola, right? I got that right, thank you. Uh, Bill Gates, he owns a lot of other things as well, but, um, um, like uh, a swimming pool with an underwater sound system. Uh, because Bill Gates is the second richest person in the world. One used to say the second richest man in the world, but you can't do that anymore, uh, of course. The, the richest person in the world is also a man who's called Carlos Slim, but no one's heard of him because he's Mexican. In 1915, the designers of the Coca-Cola bottle went to the local library to get inspiration. And they read about coca, a coca leaf, and the cola nut in Encyclopedia Britannica. But they didn't get inspired. But they happened to turn a page, I'm, I'm, I'm very soon finished, I'm like two minutes, I think. They happened to turn a page back from coca to cocoa, and they saw there an illustration of the cocoa pot which is what you make chocolate of. And this became the model for the Coca-Cola bottle. First they tried to make it like as thick in the middle as, as this, but then the bottles fell, so they had to do it narrow. But the funny thing is, of course, that there's no cocoa in Coca-Cola whatsoever, only coca. When we say the word word, we know it's the word for a word and the name of a computer program. But we don't always think about it. When we say orange, we know it's both a fruit and a color, but we don't always think about it. When we say something is avocado or peach, then we know it and we think about it. And when we say that something is Coca-Cola colored, then we definitely think about it. But are we thinking of the color of the Coke or the color of the can? I have a friend in Copenhagen who's allergic to oranges. And in Copenhagen there is an orange juice called real juice. Richtig juice. 
and she can drink it. When I was a child in Sweden, we didn't have the word orange. We had the fruit. The fruit was called apelsin, and it still is. And the sin in apelsin corresponds to the chin in China, because apelsin means Chinese apple. The color was called brand gul, fire yellow, because orange wasn't yet a color of its own. But now it is, like a country that used to be a part of another, but now is its own. So orange has become independent. But also international, because orange is called orange. And isn't that quite typical for how we develop these days? We get more individual and independent, while at the same time we're becoming more like everybody else. Now the question is, is Uran happier now, on its own, alone? Wasn't it quite fine being with yellow and being fire yellow? <laughs>